So, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 25, verses 14 through 30 today. It's called the parable of the talents. The parable of the talents. And, you know, uh, the, the image I put up here is my title image. There's one man over here that's sort of sad. There's, there's a king that's sitting up here on the top, and he's handing a chest of, of gold to another man who's just like, wow, you know, and then there's this other man that's down here on the side. And, uh, you know, it, it, it just represents sort of what today we'll be talking about. Uh, at the beginning, I was going to actually read the whole thing to you, but I actually put it also, so I didn't, it, it's long, so I didn't want to uh, drag it out that way by reading it first and then going through. I, I want to actually read it to you uh, through, but if you want it also, the, the parallel to it is in Luke chapter 19, verses 11 through 27. You know, we recently had discussed, you know, and exploring, you know, all the necessities that, you know, uh, for those during the Great Tribulation, you know, this is the same thing. Jesus is still talking about those that were in the Great Tribulation, you know, and how they would uh, have to endure actually all the way up into the time when Christ was turned, you know. And so, you know, the, the conversation now has a pivot point right here. And that pivot point is towards uh, them actually, you know, from engaging directly, you know, from, and actually the conversation now pivots towards the importance of engaging directly into the unfolding of his kingdom rather than just looking at those signs or, or having to deal with those things, you know, that, are, uh, that were indicators of his coming. You know, and as I said before to you, that all the Scripture, you know, the Bible says that all Scripture is beneficial for us, right? And I, I got a few verses here, and I, I probably said this a couple of weeks ago, and maybe keep repeating it, because all Scripture is always important. You know, it's, even though it's not, you know, this Scripture is for those during that tribulation time, it's also for us today. Right, we can use it, even though it's not directly written towards to us or for us. We can still use it, even though it is really just as important for us as it is for those people. You know, Second Timothy uh, chapter three, verses sixteen and seventeen says that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction. For instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. And, you know, basically what he's saying is that all the scripture is for our good to be able to help us through our journey, right? And, and, and equip us. And it actually, not only that, it's telling you what it's for. You can use it for correction. You can use it to instruct people to do the right things you can it's it's very profitable that's how where you get where we get our doctrines from and you know and and you know it's all and this is what he says another thing is all scripture is given by the inspiration of god that means it is he said it. it's, it's coming through him not through mere man but through him so you know and it says that and you know romans chapter 15 verse 4 says for whatever things were written before were written for our learning, that we through the patience and comfort of the Scripture might have hope. So, you know, these are the things that, that, that we need to read and we need to understand because it gives us the hope that we have. Could you imagine going through life not having God's Word? Many people go through life nowadays and they don't have any of God's Word, none. And they don't want, even want to read it. They don't believe it's God's word. They say it's written by man or whatever. But I believe, you know, this scripture is true, right? And I believe it's directed, even though it's directed, you know, this part of scripture that we're fixing to read, even though it's directed towards those people in that tribulation, that we can use it as prof profitable for us at this time too. So, you know, and, and again, like I said earlier, you know, when we were talking it before, you know, one of the remarkable aspects about God 
you know, in his word is that, you know, even though while it's historical document, it's a prophetic document, right? It also serves as an active, you know, tool for teaching and, and for us today. It's, it, there's all kinds, it's multifaceted, you know? And so, you know, like I said, Wednesday, I went to uh, Odina Baptist Church and, and, and I went to the prayer meeting and, pray, uh, you know, uh, Pastor West taught on, you know, Psalms 24, verses 1 and 2. It says, you know, and that's what it, what it says right here. It says, the earth is the Lord's and all its fullness, the world and those who dwell therein. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the waters. And I thought to myself when I went there, you know, I said, wow, isn't that really amazing how that sort of will talk about what, you know, as I was listening to his preaching, I said, you know, that that's just like what I'm fixing to preach on, you know, th this week, you know, a little bit. Uh, it's going to be very similar, not exactly the same thing, but, you know, where it sits there, you know, he taught us things about everything. One of the things he said was, he says, on your money. How much money belongs to God every every week or every two weeks that you get paid a check? And and most people think the very first thing they think is ten percent, but that's not the right answer. All of it belongs to God, and this is what it says. It says, "Who whose earth is it?" It says, "The earth is the Lord's," you know, and the fullness of it. That means everything that's in it. Everything belongs to him, right? Even those, it says the world and those who dwell therein. That means each and every one of you belong to our Lord Jesus Christ. Y'all all belong, everybody that's out here, all the money, all the time, everything. It's not 10%, it's all of it, you know? And so as I was thinking about what he was saying there, it was, it, 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 you know, very much opened my, you know, not opened my eyes. I kind of already knew this, but, you know, I was thinking how great it is that he can use things to, to help remind me of what my sermon needs to be on, where I need to direct it. So that's the reason why I even brought it into these things. You know, he's, he suggested, you know, and that's that everything under heaven is God's. Thus, in stewarding our lives and our resources, we're ultimately managing God's property, right? He's made us stewards of his own property. And so now that's where we get into our service. You know, now, think about this. Go to Matthew chapter 25, verses 14 through 18. He says in verse 14, it says, For the kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling to a far country who called his own servants and delivered his goods to them. And to one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, to each according to his own ability, and immediately went on a journey. Then he who had received the five talents went and traded them and made another five talents. And likewise, he who had received two gained two more also, but he who had received one Dug, a hole, dug in the ground and hid his Lord's money. You know, Jesus is mentioning four, four guys here, right? One is the one going on long trips. He's got everything. The other, he entrusted the other three men. And he did it. One of the things you need to look at, it was according to his, each one's own ability. He knew each person. He knew who they were. He knew about them. And he said, you know what? This man, I give five talents. He, he, he's obviously, I can, you know, his abilities are, are greater than maybe the abilities of the one that had two or the one that had one, right? And you see what happened was that the, the one that had five talents, he had, he was, he, that's what he was given. And, and, and he had, you know, five more talents was given. And, and it says, the, the, he that gave, gave him two did the same and two more talents he brought back. And the one, though, had just dug that hole. You know, but then after a long time, it says, verse 19, it says, after a long time, those servants came, to, you know, the, the Lord of those servants came to settle accounts with him. So 
Let me, let me explain to you what a talent is. I just, I, I just, I'm going to switch right here because we see this word talent. And a lot of people use that word talent as being a talent like what you're gifted, your, your abilities. But really what it is, in the Bible, this talent is referring to a, a weight. It's actually referring to a, a weight that there is. And it's a, a, you know, it has to do with monetary, right? A monetary unit of weight. And that was actually the largest weight that there was. It's sort of like if you look at things being, uh, you, you know, I'm trying to, to explain it to you. You just look at gold, take for instance, and you have an ounce and you have a pound. But, you know, at the time, the ounce would have been, you know, is, is like a lot, you know, you... Well, you have to understand money in that terms. You know, it's sort of like you have a $5 bill, a $10 bill, a $20 bill, a $100 bill. You know, and each one of them are different, but they're still a bill, right? So you had, at that time, you had weights because they weighted out gold and silver, right? And different, different other materials and metals, which is real money, by the way. So right here, when you look at the value of a talent could vary significantly depending on whether it was a talent of silver or a talent of gold. So, it, you know, and it, like I said, in, in ancient times, a talent was one of the largest units of measurements for weight and currency, which could roughly, now here's the roughly, this, it could weigh roughly between 58 and 80 pounds. So, you know, that's 26 to 36 kilograms. That's how much a talent could weigh. There was a amount that was there, but there, that was what they believed. So I, I did some calculations. I wanted to do some calculation. What would a talent be today in gold? So based on the weight of gold uh, of a talent, let's just say it was 75 pounds. That's sort of like a rough estimate. So the, you know, and it, the price of gold as of, you know, this week was $2,328 per Troy ounce, right? So the value of that would be approximately two million five hundred and forty-six thousand two hundred and forty-four dollars and eighteen cents. It's a pretty big sum of money, right there for one talent. So then, when we look at it, we see based on what these men were given. The, the servant that was given five talents was given 12,000 or 12 million seven hundred and twenty seven hundred and thirty one thousand two hundred and twenty dollars and ninety cents it's a pretty good bit of money right and and that would be considerably for what it would be back then because if you actually look gold here's something about gold that's really funny when gold was a tw one ounce gold piece was worth $20. At that time, you could buy a suit and a really, really fancy dinner, right? A really, really fancy suit and a really, really fancy dinner for $20 gold piece in the 1800s. That was, that was what it was worth. Today, you look at what clothing, if you really want to go look at what it costs and stuff, if you really want to buy the fanciest suit and go in really, really nice, you could take that one ounce, which would be about $2,000, and buy you a really nice suit and, and also go have a really nice dinner. You could do the, basically the same thing. So the gold is the same, even though our money differences may have changed. So now when you look at it, this is basically the same thing that they were given. They were given this huge amount of money. You know, the, the second servant was given $5 million Ninety-two thousand four hundred eighty-eight dollars, and the and the 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 one with just one talent was given like two and a half million dollars. Two and a half million. That's that's a huge amount of money that would be for us. Now, here's what he goes on and says in verses twenty to twenty-three. He says, "So he who had received the five five talents came back and brought five talents others, saying." Lord, you delivered unto me five talents. Look, I have gained five more, ta five more talents besides them. So the, his master said, he said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You are faithful over a few things. 
I'll make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. You know that right there, he give back. That amount was $25 million. $25,462,441. If we based it off of 75 pounds being a, 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 the uh, a talent. Then he said to the next one, you know, the next one came over and he says, he who had also received two talents came and said, Lord, look, you delivered unto me two talents, and I have gained two more talents besides them. And his Lord said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I'll make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your, of your Lord. And that would have been, he would give back $10, $10 million dollars. So now, the application to those that would be living in, that, in the tribulation at that time is that, you know, stewardship of God's gifts that He gives you, even under that extreme hardness, the hardships it's going to go through, those going through the, the tribulation are called to continue faithfully, right? In serving God, whatever they've been given, whether it's a spiritual gift or material resources or even the opportunities to minister, right? They're, they need to be faithful, even through those hard times. And that's to those people that's there. That's one of the things you can take the, to, 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 to look at what this parable means. But, you know, even us, you know, you see, even now, when you look at it, and, and now and then, you see some people will be given significantly... Uh, more responsibility. It's all really according to their abilities at that time. You know, just as there are, are, are now those who have responsibilities now according to their abilities, right? According to what they have. You know, and then you got, you know, in verse 23, he said to the Lord, listen, listen to what he says. He says to, the, to them, he said to, he said to him, well done, Good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I'll make you ruler over many. Enter into you. If you'll notice one thing right here, they both received the same reward. You know, uh, the principle isn't that the amount they gained, it didn't matter about how much they gained. It mattered that they were faithful, that they believed and they trusted and they knew that that Lord was coming back. And that they were faithful, and and, and they they were faithful, you know, servants, right, uh, to him. It wasn't that part. Now, going on to what we look at today, have you ever heard of three T's? Might not have, but T's the three T's are pretty interesting. And you you have heard of them, you just don't realize them. That's your time, your talents that God's given you. And then your treasures that he's given you. So your time, talents, and treasures. And, and, you know, after a long time, it says, verses 19, now it says, after a long time, the Lord of those servants came to settle accounts with them. So one day, each and every one of us will have to settle an account with him. For what he, what, you know, for what, what did you do with your time that I give you while you was here on earth? What did you do with that time? What did you do with the talents? You know, the gifts that you have. Some of you can talk better than others. Some of you can, y'all, y'all are good at doing, you know, things for other people. Y'all are good at building stuff. Y'all are good at helping other people. So what did you do with the talents he gave you while you was here on earth, right? Your abilities. And then, Lastly, what did you do with the treasures that he gave you? What did you do with those treasures, those resources that he entrusted to you? You know, when you think about that, think about those things. You know, this is a part of what this story is really all about. So just to go back with some scriptures of something that would reinforce this, Think about time. Here's what Paul says in Ephesians chapter 5, 15 and 16 about time. He says, So when so then when you walk circumstance went so then that you walk circumstance I can't say that circum 
speckly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time for the days are evil. See, you're supposed to redeem that time because the days are evil, right? You're supposed to be not as fools, but as, as wise. In Psalms chapter 90, verses 12 says, So teach us to number our days that we might gain a heart of wisdom. So he wants us to number our days so that we may, you know, I got to turn this off, guys. I'm sorry. It gets really hot up here. So <laughs> it's like it feels like it's blowing right on me. So anyways, and I, I'm grateful to have it, but it's, 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 sometimes you have to turn it off. But, but right here, Psalms chapter 90, teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. You know, that has to do with your, your time. Now, with your talents, you know, it talks about 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 10. It says, each one of you has received a gift. Minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. You know, it says each one of you has received. God has given each person an ability, regardless of who you are. Your, your ability may just be super nice, to be able to be super nice to people, to, to love on them. You know, there's many different abilities God's given you. And that's was what? For the manifold grace of God. For to minister to one another. You know, Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 4 and 7, it says, These are the diverse gifts. These are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are differences of ministries, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of activities, but the same God who works all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. See what I'm saying? So he gives everybody a different thing so that we all can be profited from it, right? So then your treasures. I mean, Matthew, God clearly sat there and says in Matthew chapter 6, 19 and, uh, tw uh, through 21, he says, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on our earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, your heart will be also. So that's, you know, very clearly you're supposed to not be focused so much on the outwardly materialistic world that we have, but you're supposed to focus on what matters is, is in your heart and what you do with that time and what you do, what, what you do with those resources. A lot of times, whether it's for God through something or, or however it goes. Second Corinthians, Paul says there, says in verses nine or chapter nine, verses six and seven says, but I say this, he who, who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So let each one give as a purpose in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. And that's how you need to be given when you do give. You need to give it cheerfully. You don't even give if you're doing it grudgingly because it's just probably not going to help you. You're just sort of wasting your money in a way. But if you give cheerfully, that's how he wants you to give, right? You know, these, are, these principles right here are, 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 were, that are meant to manage our time wisely, right? We're meant to utilize God's gifts. You know, he wants us to give God-given, you know, talents that he gives up for us. And also... For the good of others, you know, that's for the good of others and to steward our material wealth, you know, that we have in a way that honors up, honors God, not in uh, the way that honors us. So those are some things that gives you an idea of how we should be. You know, when we look at Matthew, the rest, verses 24 and 25, he says to this one, he says, and then he who had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew that you were a hard man, reaping where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. And I was afraid and went and hid your talent in the ground. Look, there you have your, here you have what's yours. You know, 
Even though Jesus sits there and says in the next few verses that we'll read, He says, You know that I reap where I have not sown, and that I gather where I have not scattered seed. You know, I believe this man isn't telling the truth here. Right? So think about it. This man received two and a half million dollars. Right? That, to invest. He said, here's two and a half million dollars. Go and invest it. You know, make something with it. Now, if anybody give you two and a half million dollars, said, hey, here's your two and a half million dollars. Go out there, do what you have to do to invest in it, to do what you have to do. Then how is that him being hard? You know what I'm saying? I mean, how is that? He give it to him to invest. Now, you know, you know how can you call him a hard person? And, and look, you know, look at what he was given. You know, look at what the man gave. He gave, you know, what did we say? 12 million to one, 5 million to another. What did Paul just say about sowing? He just said sowed seeds. He says he who sows sparingly will reap sparingly. And he who sows abundantly will reap abundantly, right? So, what is that right there? Is he, did he not sow the, that seed and give it to those guys? Did he not scatter it to them? Look like he gave it to all according to their abilities. So I don't believe that tr statement is really true of what that man said. You know, whether or not, you know, it was true, I believe it was just an excuse at best that that man was giving. Now, you know, it says, but his Lord answered and said to him, you wicked and lazy servant, you knew that I reap where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. So you ought have deposited my money with the bankers. And at my coming, I would have received back my own interest, back my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to the one who has 10 talents. Now, here's something you need to look at right here. And, and look at the verse 28. Does it say that he took, he just, the guy give him the 10 talents, right? The one who had 10, he'd give five and he had one. So he went and said, look, I had done this. Now, why did it say, go, so take the talent from him and give it to the one who has 10 talents? So he still has the 10 talents. If you ever look right there, he still has it. He didn't just take it from him and say, wow, you know, look at that. So he's, again, that proves that he wasn't hard. Because if he's done, give it to him and he has it, how, how do you do that? And he says, hey, wow, I'm going to put you over this little thing, so I won't put you over big things. So, you know, like God, he has ultimate unlimited resources, right? So that little bit of, little bit of something right there isn't much. And we look at it as a lot, but it's... It's really not much at all, according to him. But what I read when I was reading through uh, my uh, commentaries and stuff, I came, you know, I like John Wolvard. And one of the things he said about this part right here, and he said, and I, and I wanted to bring it to you guys because I thought it was very interesting. And, and he, he, even he says it's an interesting question. So listen right here. An interesting question is that, it is not directly answered in the text is why the one talent man did not put it in the bank. Most expositors are, re are rather vague in their explanation of this detail. The explanation seems to be that this wicked man had the same kind of cunning that Judas Iscariot used when he accepted the money for the betrayal of Christ. Judas had reasoned that if Jesus was indeed the Messiah, he would, his betrayal would not matter and that he would uh, be ahead 30 pieces of silver. If Jesus was not the Messiah, he would at least have the, sil have the silver. So the wicked one man, one talent man, likewise reasoned, if my Lord returns... I will be able to give it back to him and he cannot accuse me of being a thief. But if he does not return, there will be no record of that money belonging to him such as would be true if I deposited it in the bank 
and then I will be able to use the money myself. His basic problem, like the problem with Judas, was a lack of faith. You see, and so that one talent man did not believe that his for sure that his Lord was coming back. Therefore, clear. Therefore, clear that that his basic problem. Therefore, it is clear that his basic problem was that he that he was a unbeliever. Simply, not simply just being unfaithful in service. You, do you, do you, does that make sense to you guys? So he, he's just like, well, you know, he's not, I don't know. And, what, and how does that relate to those that will live in that tribulation? You know, if you think about this, what does Peter sit there and say? You know, I didn't put it in here, so I'm going to have to go and read it. Second Peter sits there, uh, chapter 3, verses 3 and 4. He sits there and he says, right here, knowing this first, that scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lust, saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. You see what I'm saying? See, just like this, this man didn't really even believe that his master was coming back. He said, well, he might come back, he might not. If I put it in the ground, it's mine. If I put it in the bank, then I won't get anything from it because it will be his, right? And so if he doesn't show up, it'll just be the banker's. That's what the guy was kind of worried about. Same thing with Judas. Judas just looked at it, well, if he is the Messiah and I go over here and betray him, it ain't gonna make a difference because he's still gonna be r ruling, you know, and if he's not the Messiah, then guess what? I just got 30 pieces of silver. And so, you know, that was this guy's problem right here. And so the people in the tribulation, there are people even now, they don't believe that a rapture is going to happen or they don't believe in whatever. You know, they don't believe God's really coming back. And that's why he says, you know, ever since the day of, uh, uh, of that day, the, the fathers have said, He's coming. Where is the promise of his coming? He ain't coming back. So they don't believe. And that's the same thing will be for those in that tribulation. He's saying he's come back. When you see these, these signs, these things that's happening, know that you got, you got basically three and a half years. And when you see the abomination of desolation in standing in the holy place, that's a sign for those who believe. Oh, wow, I just seen that. In three and a half years, like Daniel says, which is inspired word of God, he's going to be back. So I better work for him. See, and that's what the other two men did. They give their, their talents. You know, they give their stuff. You know, the one man's talent, the one, the one talent man's failure was fundamentally due to a lack of faith. He just didn't believe in his master's returning. Leading to what? An inaction and ultimately his condemnation. You know, a faithful steward who trusts in his master's return, again, is going to go and do those things. He's going to understand it. he's coming back and he's going to, I'm going to have to deal with him. You know, but for those, you know, and so, you know, those believers who don't make it through. Now, here's one of the things. I know it's going to be rough for in the tribulation. The Bible says it's going to be rough during that tribulation time. Worse than any man has ever seen. For those that, that don't make it, but those that are faithful. Here's what it says. Revelations chapter 6, verse 9. It says, When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for their testimony which they held. And they cried in a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, will you judge until you judge and avenge our blood of those who dwell on the earth? Then a white robe was given to each one of them, and, they, and it was said to them that they should rest a little while longer until both the number of their fellow servants and their brethren who would be killed as they were was complete. See? So where, where is the, he's, he's, he's under the altar. You know, this part where he's, they're sitting there under the altar, the, uh, you know, under that altar, 
They're right there next to God, just like when he says, how I have gathered you as a, as a chick. They're right there. How much safer can that person be? You know, and because of what they did, they were given white robes. And then later on, it sits there and it says, Revelation 20, and I saw the thrones and, 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 and they that sat on them and judgment was committed to them. And then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for the witness to Jesus and the word of God who had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands. And they had lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years, but the rest of the dead did not live until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power, but they shall be priest of God even of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. You know, that's a lot better than being cast out into utter darkness. Look what it says later on. He sits there and says, verses 29 through 30. This is back to Matthew, verses 29 and 30. It says, for everyone who has, more will be given. And he will have an abundance But for him who does not have, even what he has will be taken away and cast the unprofitable servant into outer darkness and there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. You know, when I look at it and I think of it in, in words today, you know, everyone who believes will be more blessed when Jesus returns, right? There will be such an abundance in his kingdom. There's such, and I, I just, I mean, if, if it was no big deal to have that amount of money to give it to somebody to just invest, that's what he's done. He's given you your life, and, 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 and it, 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 your life's a big deal. Our life's, my life, all of our lives are a big deal. Don't get me wrong, but it's an abundance, right? And he's given you the money you live off of, the money you do. You, he's given you your life. He's given you your talents. What are you going to do with those three T's? You know, that's how you look at it now. You know, it says there's such an abundance in the kingdom, but he who doesn't believe, everything will be taken. Just like that one who was, those who don't believe, they won't go into a kingdom. They won't go into heaven. They'll go into what? Everlasting darkness. They'll be cast into there. And they'll cry forever. Just like that, just like that, that rich man and Lazarus. You remember Lazarus and the rich man? Could you imagine crying for just a drop of water from somebody who had leprosy and you saw the skin peeling off of them? You know, you saw that that filth that they lived in the dogs licked their wounds but you're so much in agony that you would just hey please just give me a drip of water off of his finger you know that's that's a terrible place to be i don't want nobody to be there in that place none whatsoever so taken as a whole you know and i'm back to uh john wolver he says, taken as a whole, the illustration which, in, which interpret the doctrine of the second coming and makes practical application of truth emphasizes the two themes of watchfulness and serving. What is true for those anticipating the second coming is also true for those anticipating Christ's coming of his church, for his church, Right? You know, like I said earlier, one day, every one of us will have to settle an account. And that account that we're going to have to settle is, what did you do with your time while you were here on earth? What did you do with your talent while you were here on earth? And what did you do with your treasure that you were given, your resources while you were here on earth? You know, so he should have all to have deposited the monies with the bankers you know, at my coming, at least I would have received my own back my own interest. You know, I look at a lot of times that part, one part, you should at least believed I was coming back. Believe in me, even if you don't do anything. 
You know, think about that thief on the cross that day. He stopped. He said, you know what? I believe. They, they were both mocking. They were both of them mocking. It said both mocked Christ while he was up there. But then he says, hold on. This man don't deserve what he's, what he's, what he's getting done to. He said, Lord, remember me when you come into that kingdom. He just believed. And what did Jesus say to him? Today you'll be with me in paradise. So, you should at least put it in the bank. Bank on this. Jesus is coming. So, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we just come to you today and we just thank you for your word. Thank you for everything you've done for us, Lord. We love you and we praise you. We just ask that you would Go with us through the week and help this word dwell within us. Help us to live it, to be it. Help us to, to manage our time wisely and our resources and the talents and the gifts that you've given us, the abilities that you've given us to share your word. Help us to, to, to utilize what you want us to utilize. In Jesus' name we pray.